Supermarket Income PLC is the first European REIT that, as the name suggests, focuses purely on properties for grocery stores and supermarkets. This first mover advantage helped the company to grow quickly and with a massive dividend yield of 8.3%. It sounds like a good choice for investors seeking passive cash flow. But high dividend yields are often an indication for slowing or risky businesses. Is this also the case for this FTSE 250 listed company? Well, in today's video I'll break it down. I look at the business models and the markets of supermarket income, analyze their strategic position by doing a Porter's Five Forces analysis and have a look at the latest financial statements to see how they are doing. I'll also check the valuation to determine their fair value. So sit back, relax and let's explore supermarket income's investment potential together. My name is Florian, welcome to Cashflow Maniac. Supermarket Income PLC has the ticker symbol of SUPR and they are listed on the London Stock Exchange. They are working in the real estate sector and were founded in 2017. The headquarter is in London and the market cap sits at around 900 British pounds at the moment. Supermarket Income is a REIT that focuses on a hand-picked portfolio of mission-critical and omnichannel supermarkets, providing their investors an exposure to future-proofed stores in the growing UK grocery market. Super capitalizes on the essential nature of grocery retail, which has demonstrated remarkable resilience even in tough economic conditions. By targeting large format stores and leading grocery companies with long lease term as operators, the company ensures a steady income stream. As the first supermarket read in Europe, supermarket income has a unique position and can benefit from the first mover advantage, which allows them to secure prime properties with minimal competition. The company has a portfolio value of around 1.7 billion British pounds and their property counts is 73. This is not bad when considering that the company is still quite young and was only founded in 2017. So how could they achieve this? The biggest tenants by value are Tesco and Sainsbury. Combined, these two companies make up 77% of their rent income. And with these tenants, Super has built up a nice portfolio of properties all over the UK and also in France. And this makes total sense when we have a look at the greater grocery market share change in the second half of 2023. Here, these two companies are the ones that could win market share, especially from discounters like Aldi. And they can do this with the same strategy as supermarket income by targeting large format and omnichannel stores. As we can see here, these stores saw quite an increase in growth compared to the average UK grocery growth. Discounters especially seem to have a hard time currently and the new store openings are slowing down. Super can take advantage of this weakness by acquiring solid assets and leasing them to their growing operators. Most of their rents are inflation linked with 71% linked to RPI, the retail price index, and further 7% linked to CPI, the consumer price index. Since their inception, the company had an occupancy rate of 100% and a remarkable track record of 100% rent collected. This is quite remarkable and we definitely don't see this with every read. For me, this shows the quality of the properties and the robustness of the sector overall and is proof that their management knows what they are doing. Speaking of management, with Vincent Pryor on the management team, the company has an absolute expert in supermarket property management. As former property portfolio manager at Sainsbury and before that head of retail advisory at Jones Lang LaSalle, he not only knows in detail how to operate a supermarket, but most likely also brings valuable contacts into the company. But Vince is not the only one with industry insights on the management team. Everyone on the management team brings some useful know-how and specialization to the company and I believe that this team is one of their biggest strengths. The global food and grocery retail market is expected to grow with a compounded annual growth rate of 3.2% which is just slightly higher than the US growth rate as shown in the graph. This growth can mostly be attributed to increased online grocery sales and omnichannel strategies. Amazon has actually accelerated the trends by acquiring brick and mortar shops like for example Whole Foods and merging them with their e-commerce. And as one to two day delivery is becoming more widespread, the grocers are optimizing their real estate investments 
to accommodate these new models, which is also in line with Super's portfolio strategy. The biggest share of the UK market are held by the biggest customers of the REIT, Tesco and Sainsbury. Now, we already know that the company has a strong management team and a good portfolio and is operating in a growing market. So let's analyze their strategic position by doing the Porter's Five Forces analysis. First of all, I would estimate the threat of new entrants is low. The supermarket real estate market is a very specialized and fragmented one. Most jobs either belongs to smaller or private investors or to the shop operators themselves. The business model of super requires high capex and a good understanding of this limited market, which makes it very hard for new players to compete against them. The threat of substitutes I would also estimate as low. With this emphasis on distinctive large format stores in prime locations and as Europe's first supermarket read, the company occupies a unique market position, leveraging a first move advantage to secure the best properties with minimal competition. The long lease terms further hinder their customers from relocating. And this is also reflected in their impressive 100% occupancy rate since their inception. The competitive rivalry is medium. Supermarket income is still the only supermarket read on the market, but there are still many smaller real estate investors and also the shop operators themselves that are the competition here. From an investor's point of view, there are many different REITs out there that are competing for investors' money. But their unique business models, coupled with the recession-resistant nature of supermarket income, can still make it a very appealing investment. The bargaining power of the customers I would estimate as low to medium. The long lease terms and great locations do help the company in negotiation with their customers. However, the sheer size of the major customers like Tesco and Sainsbury do give these companies quite some bargaining power. The bargaining power of their suppliers I would estimate as quite high. Prime retail locations are limited, giving the property developers and sellers quite some bargaining power. And even though the size and market position of Super does help, if they want to own the best properties in the best locations, they have to pay the price for it. For maintenance and remodeling, there are many players out there, so the company can basically choose their suppliers in this case. This gives the company quite some bargaining power in this case. Overall, as the first supermarket read and with their experienced management team, I think that the company does have a great and unique position in the market. It will be hard for other bigger players out there to compete against Super, especially when giving some more time to acquire an even bigger and better portfolio. The long lease terms with the high quality customers further lower the risks of a loss of occupancy or rent. If you do like the analysis so far, please smash the like button and subscribe to the channel in order not to miss my next video. When we look at the performance of the company and compare it against the Morningstar UK commercial index, the company did underperform on every available time frame. One year basis, five year basis, and even since the company inception in 2017. In fact, the company is trading quite a bit below their IPO price. But at the moment, the company is also trading close to the biggest discount against their net asset value. From fundamental point of view, we see a very nice growth in revenue and also in operating cash flow and free cash flow. And while the net income and the EPS was down, the operating income did increase by more than 86% per year over the last five years, which is really remarkable. But it is still a bit worrying to see the net income and especially the earnings per share decreasing. In a minute, we will take a closer look to see if we can find out what the reason for this is. But first, let's also check the health of their balance sheet. Here we see that the EBITDA is increasing nicely, but we also see that the dividend payments are currently above the free cash flow generation. So the company is financing the dividend with debt and issuing new shares. Especially the share dilution is a nightmare for every investor. Over the past five years, the company did issue more than 46% new shares every year. The debt to EBITDA leverage is 6.1 times. And while this is double my threshold for regular companies, it is still not too bad for a REIT. Vici, another REIT that I'm following, for example, 
is sitting around the value of 5.5 times. The company also has a BBB plus rating from Fitch, which stands for a good rating with low default risks. And they could even lower the loan to value over the last few years to currently 33%. This is well below the maximum rating of 60%. 40% of the debt is secured while 60% is unsecured and the average debt maturity is 4.1 years. In fact, we see that a huge portion of the long-term debt is only due in 2029. When we look at the annual report from 2023, we can see that the company could increase their gross rental income in their last fiscal year compared to the year before. And the same is true for their net rental income. And here we also see a huge loss factor, which is the change in fair value of invested properties. These costs are basically a one-time effect that is coming from a change in the fair value of the invested properties according to their valuation. What we can also see though is that in the last fiscal year they borrowed more than double the money than the year before and while they did also increase their repayments it is still far below the level from 2022. And this results in quite an increase in bank interests paid. Of course this also had a huge effect on the earnings per share and as we just saw in TradingView the basic and diluted earnings per share in the last year were negative. There is an alternative calculation for the EPS for REITs that is according to the guidelines of the EPRA, the European Public Real Estate Association. And according to this calculation, the EPS sits at currently 4.6, which is still quite a bit lower compared to the 5.9 from last year. The forecast for the company doesn't seem too bad and the one year price target based on the estimation of six analysts has a maximum upside of around minus 70% an average upside of around 30% and a maximum upside of almost 40%. The earnings per shares are expected to grow with a CAGR of around 4% until 2027 and the revenue CAGR for the next years should even be at around 9%. The company is paying a huge dividend of 8.3% but we already saw that the payout ratio sits at above 100%. Please take care when looking at the data for dividend yield and growth because on US sites like Seeking Alpha, this dividend yield is calculated in US dollars and includes the exchange rate changes. For my calculation here, I use the dividend payments in pounds to exclude any special effects. And in this case, I'll come to a yearly dividend growth of 1.75% over the last five years. This does not include the big jump in the first year, because the first year of operations was also not a full year. So the company could increase the dividends on a regular basis, but only with a very low growth rate. For a valuation as a read, it doesn't make so much sense to look at the multiples that we usually look at. So let's see how the yield of the company compares to their own history. And here we currently are at the highest yield ever. For my fair value calculation, I only use the Gordon Growth model in this case, because I don't think that the other models make sense when valuating a read. And in this case, when only using the dividends, we can see that the fair value from the growing growth model sits at 1.7 pounds at the moment compared to the stock price of 0.72. When including the margin of safety of 20%, we come to a fair value of 0.85 British pounds. So from this point of view, the company also seems to be quite cheap at the moment. So to come back to the question, is supermarket income a good investment? The focus on properties for omnichannel and large scale supermarkets, while quite a niche products, promises a good and stable growth above market average. Their experienced management team has all the know-how and industry expertise on their hands to leverage the first mover advantage and to find the best properties for their strategy. But this is also one of the biggest risks. The market is limited and while the current size of the company still leaves plenty of room for growth, it is up to the management team to find good investments that can keep delivering good returns. The fundamentals of the company look good with only one-time effects being responsible for the decline in the bottom line in 2023. But their operations are steadily improving. So I would expect that this will keep growing further next year. As an investor, I am strongly opposed to having my share in the company continually diluted. Although this is common practice for REITs, the extent to which Super engages in this is my primary concern. 
an annual share dilution of over 45% is significant and cannot be overlooked. So I am not invested at the moment and the company needs to reduce this share dilution significantly before I would even consider investing in it. But I also think that the company can be a decent investment, especially if you are looking for a high dividend yield in a recession proof market. But please, before investing, do your own research and only use this video as a starting point for your own analysis. And guys, if you're looking for companies that pay huge dividends, you definitely don't want to miss my video on Greencode UK Wind that is currently also trading very close to the biggest discount against net asset value. If you want to learn about the potentials, but also the risks, you should check out this video. That being said, thank you so much for watching guys. If you did find the analysis helpful, please smash the like button and subscribe to the channel in order not to miss my next video. And if you do have any suggestions or recommendations of what I should analyze next, please leave me a comment down in the comment section. I'm trying my best to reply to all of them.